Hello everyone, my name is Kate Marquis. I'm a nurse at the Life Support Learning Center at UVA Health, and today we're going to be talking about Masters of Disguise, the Acutely Altered Patient. Our objectives today are to identify multiple etiologies for altered mental status, identify methods to systematically rule out some of these etiologies, and to articulate a comprehensive neurological exam. So why do we care about altered mental status? Well, this is a common occurrence in emergency medicine, and it has many etiologies. This isn't always, okay, someone's having a stroke, or they hit their head, or they had a little too much alcohol. Um, this, these uh, signs and symptoms can really be a result of a dysfunction in any of these body systems, um, endocrine, cardiovascular, respiratory, etc. This affects patients of all ages, from cradle to grave, so to speak. And it's really easy to get pigeonholed in a single diagnosis based on presentation. And we're actually going to talk a little bit about that today. We want to get away from, oh, it's always going to be a stroke, or it's always going to be um, acute alcohol intoxication or something like that. We want to keep our mind open, and that way we don't get burned when it is something else. And do a case study methodology here. Uh, EMS has been dispatched for a 21-year-old male with altered mental status, and it's 2 a.m. And if you guys are like me, I work in a uh, a college town, so we see this not infrequently here, unfortunately. Uh, so I already am biased, right? I already have in my head what's wrong with this patient, what could possibly be going on with them, and it's a very narrow. Um, diagnosis set here. So it's really important to kind of keep an open mind because otherwise we could miss some things. When we come upon the patient now, whether that's they're being uh, transferred to our hospital or uh, I'm the EMS crew picking them up, I notice that the patient is sleepy, his speech is slurred, he's disoriented to time and situation, He's intermittently redirectable, but he really requires someone watching him at all times to stay in bed or to stay in the stretcher. He's a terrible historian, and there are no overt signs of trauma. So what's wrong with this guy? Like I said, I'm already a little biased just kind of thinking about this. But really, look at all of these differential diagnoses. About a few there. Maybe illicit drug use, but it may also be licit drug use. Maybe he's just having a bad reaction to something. Could be a respiratory disorder. Maybe he's hypoxic. That's why he's confused and maybe a little agitated. Maybe he's in massive metabolic disarray. Could be a psychiatric disorder, right? Especially in that age group it's where these things kind of start manifesting themselves. Maybe he's had a traumatic injury. We just don't see any of the signs yet. Or an other neurologic disorder. If he was an older adult, we would also consider UTI. Oftentimes, they will cause um, acute confusion in the elderly, um, as well as all of these others. So let's talk about uh, illicit and illicit drug use here. Muscle relaxers, narcotics, these are all kind of normal things that we think about that people could be taking that may cause a depressed uh, mental status here. But keep in mind that these may be listed. These may be prescribed to the patient, and they may just be having a bad reaction to it, or it's a new dose, or maybe they've taken a little bit more than they usually do, um, or maybe they've mixed it with something, such as alcohol, so they're having a more profound effect. Steroids. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen anyone on steroids. Uh, sometimes they become a little bit like the, the Incredible Hulk. They get agitated. Um, antihistamines as well can cause neurologic depression here. Antiemetics such as phenergan can cause drowsiness, can cause sleepiness. Tricyclic antidepressants can depress the central nervous system, and this is through the blocking of uh, the reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine. This may cause increased confusion in the elderly. Then we look at our licit slash illicit drugs over here, alcohol um, being one of them causing altered mental status, spice, um, spice can be mixed with a myriad of other things. Um, narcotics, cocaine, hallucinogens can all cause people to act altered. But something else we want to consider is withdrawal, especially from alcohol. Um, alcohol withdrawal can cause nausea, vomiting, tremor, proximal sweats, anxiety, agitation. They may have tactile, auditory, or visual disturbances. Um, they may have a headache. They may seize and they may just be disoriented. So this is something that is very dangerous that we kind of need to keep in the back of our head. It may not necessarily be that the patient has took 
too much of something, but maybe they haven't taken enough of something. So these are all things we want to kind of keep in the back of our head here. So what are we going to do about it? We want to take a sample history. So that's signs and symptoms, allergies, medications, past medical history, last oral intake, and events leading up. So we really want to kind of get a good history, a good background on this patient so we can figure out, okay, is this a, a new medication that they've been prescribed? Um, is this a medication that maybe they haven't been prescribed, but they've been taking anyway? Um, is it something illicit that maybe they shouldn't have been taking? All these other things. Uh, do they have access to medications? We want to talk to the family and the bystanders. What have they seen? What's going on with this person? How have they been acting? And they might be able to give you a better history than the patient themselves. So really utilize uh, the family and the bystanders who are there. Big point I want to make is situational awareness. And this can go for every single slide in this presentation. We as healthcare providers really need to be situationally aware. Okay, we're putting ourselves in situations where we are kind of vulnerable because we're caring for another person. We're in close proximity with them. Um, we may be in a confined space with these people. Uh, so you want to be situationally aware of kind of what's going on. Is the scene safe? And I think in the hospital setting, oftentimes we kind of take this for granted. Um, of course it's safe. I'm in the hospital. Well, it, it may not be safe depending on kind of what's going around with this patient. Be situationally aware. Um, is it safe to approach the patient? Because you need to take care of yourself first, such that you can go ahead and take care of others. Other things you want to assess, um, especially in terms of being situationally aware, is the scene. Um, so if you are EMS being dispatched, are there substances lying on the ground? Is there a bunch of white powder somewhere? Um, is there alcohol or other drug paraphernalia? Uh, you know, what, what's kind of going on? Is there, a, is there a massive party or something like that? And you want to do, look at other physiologic indicators, such as vital signs, and doing a full assessment such that you can see kind of all the signs and symptoms and put the pieces of the puzzle together. Because, like I said, these people may be poor historians. When they get to the hospital, there is potential for a tox screen. Respiratory disorders, uh, specifically hypoxia, um, can cause uh, increased agitation, anxiety, and some confusion. And it's because the brain needs oxygen and it's not getting enough oxygen. So people are trying to get more oxygen. They'll try to adjust themselves. They'll try to get out of bed and such. Um, a few causes of hypoxia are listed there. Pulmonary embolism, ARDS, pneumonia, chronic disease such as COPD. Um, carbon monoxide poisoning can be particularly devastating and is kind of sneaky in nature uh, because your pulse oximeter will read normal, whereas if you were to put a CO monitor on them, it may be elevated. So this also kind of goes to that situational awareness. If you're coming upon this patient, are there other people who are experiencing kind of the same signs and symptoms uh, as these people? Um, is it a small child first? Unfortunately, they're kind of like the canaries in the coal mine. They'll be affected by carbon monoxide before the adults will be, um, and that is a, a size issue, essentially. They're smaller, um, so they'll be more profoundly affected faster. So these are all kinds of, of things you want to think about. You know, what season is it? You know, are they in a, a confined space? So ensuring that the scene is safe before you come upon it. Things that we want to do for these patients, vital signs, and I would consider the utilization of a CO detector, especially if multiple people are experiencing similar sim symptoms here. Um, a good sample history, again, that situational awareness keeps coming up. And you want to assess uh, lung sounds. So do I have lung sounds? It's a, always a good place to start. What do they sound like? Are they diminished on one side or another? Do they, they sound crackly or what have you, wheezy? Uh, respiratory rate and work of breathing. I'm going to pause for a moment and talk about children specifically here. This is very, very, very important in children, whether you're assessing them for anything, altered mental status or, or something else. The respiratory rate and work of breathing. Um, small children are really good at hiding their actual respiratory rate behind their clothing. Um, so it's really important that if you want a good, solid, correct respiratory rate, that you lift up the child's shirt and actually watch them breathe. This will also allow you to look at their work of breathing. You can see if they're utilizing accessory muscles, um, which really can be indicative of if the child is going into respiratory failure, which can be deadly.
So word on children, really take your time, spend the time doing that. It's very important. But even in adults, you want to look at their work of breathing. Are they tripoding? Do they have nasal flaring? Or do they have accessory muscle use? Um, it's a little bit harder to see in the adults. So if you do see accessory muscle use, I'm a little bit more worried. And then going on to the color, um, are they normal for their skin tone? You know, are they uh, cool, pale, diaphoretic? Um, are they bluish in color, um, or are they dusky? Uh, what do their mucosal membranes look like? Looking in small children, you know, once uh, their color starts changing due to hypoxia, you may actually start to see a, a dusky, kind of almost mustache-looking change in, right above their top lip there. Uh, when they get to the hospital, as well as all of the aforementioned things, we'll also do a chest x-ray and a CBC. Talking about metabolic disarray and glycemic control, um, hypoglycemia uh, is something that often gets confused for acute alcohol intoxication. Uh, you can see some of the signs and symptoms below in that graphic there. This is blood sugar less than 60, but be aware of relative hypoglycemia. If someone runs routinely high, and I'm talking like 200s, etc., and you start to get them down to a more normal level, they may start experiencing symptoms of hypoglycemia. So just kind of something to be aware of with those patients who are always have elevated blood sugar. So these signs and symptoms are due to an increased secretion of epinephrine and norepi, and this is associated with significant morbidity and mortality. You may see tachycardia, tremors, seizures, and a coma if this gets bad enough. Hyperglycemia, uh, we have two different flavors there. We have DKA, which is defined as a blood glucose uh, greater than 350 to about 800 milligrams per deciliter, uh, and this may progress over a 24-hour period. You're going to find that these patients have an anion gap and ketonemia. And basically what's happening there is that insulin is the key for electrolytes and glucose to pass through the cellular membrane. So basically what needs to happen is if there is no insulin there, um, my glucose can't get into my cells. What the body says is, oh, well, clearly I don't have enough glucose. This is an insulin issue. This is a, a glucose issue. So what the body will do, and you can see on the right side of this right-hand graphic here, is it will start breaking down free fatty acids, which produce ketones. And this gives the hyperketonemia and the acidosis, as well as that kind of fruity odor um, to their breath. So in order to start treating this, what we'll do is we'll provide insulin, but as their blood sugar levels come down, the acidosis uh, still remains, the ketonemia may still remain. So we'll actually add glucose to their fluids thereafter, um, and that will allow us to continue delivering insulin, kind of resolving that acidosis that is occurring there. Keep in mind that as you do that, you have opened the door, so to speak, to all of these cells. So electrolytes such as potassium phosphate, magnesium, and calcium are now going to shift out of the extracellular space into the intracellular space. So you may see drops, you will see drops in things such as their potassium. HHS, um, on the other hand, develops over a period of time as well. This is a serum glucose greater than 600 milligrams per deciliter. There is decreased glucose utilization, but the presence of insulin stops the breakdown of fatty acids. So you're not going to see ketones, and you're going to see a lower acidemia. You'll also not see small respirations. Basically, you can see here that you're breaking down amino acids for um, glycogenesis, and this is causing hyperglycemia. In both these cases, you're going to see hyperglycemia and acute dehydration. Keep in mind that the mortality rate of HHS is as much as 20% which is 10 times higher than DKA. Metabolic disarray, such as encephalopathy. Basically what's going on with hepatic encephalopathy is this is usually due to liver failure. And what happens in liver failure is uh, there is a buildup of ammonia because the patient cannot process toxins due to this liver failure. So all of this ammonia builds up, and if patients don't take their lactulose, um, or their lactulose enemas, which we often do in the hospital, acute confusion can occur. You're also going to see a massive metabolic disarray, such as hypoglycemia, metabolic acidosis, respiratory alkalosis, because it's compensating 
um, hypokalemia, hyponatremia, hypophosphatemia. Uh, there are coagulopathies involved in this as well. These patients bleed very, very easily. And you'll also see increased ICP, which lends itself to the confusion. What are we going to do for metabolic disarray? You know, do a finger stick blood sugar. And I suggest doing this on all of your patients who are altered if it is within your protocols and within your scope of practice. Get a finger stick blood sugar on all of your patients because it's easy to rule out hypoglycemia or rule in hyperglycemia. And it's, it's quick, it's easy, it's minimally invasive. When they get to the hospital, they'll do a CMP. They may do ammonia levels if the patient is suspect for hepatic encephalopathy. Getting a good sample history will be key as well. Oh yes, this patient is newly diabetic. They're still trying to work out uh, their insulin or what have you, or they just started this new medication for it, as well as do a full assessment. Cardiac disorders. Uh, cardiac disorders, basically what we're looking for here is a decrease in perfusion. Uh, decrease in perfusion will cause people to become acutely altered, um, may not be responding appropriately, may not be responsive at all. Uh, you can see this in myocardial infarction, congestive heart failure, and arrhythmias. Basically, what we're going to do here is we're going to look for signs and symptoms of poor perfusion, such as confusion, patients being pale, sweaty, diaphoretic, having poor vital signs, so low blood pressure, or what have you. Um, we're going to get a really great sample history, do a 12-lead ECG to rule out uh, the risk for arrhythmias or MI, or to at least work towards ruling out uh, those things. Um, and we're going to assess for fluid overload, such as wet lung sounds and pitting edema in the lower extremities. Psychiatric disorders, this is just a few, I'm not going to go into all of them in, in detail, but few to talk about today. We'll start with depression. Unfortunately, in the collegiate age group, this is becoming more and more prevalent. Uh, you may see signs and symptoms of increased, decreased appetite with weight change, insomnia, hypersomnia, uh, psychomotor agitation, or even retardation, fatigue and malaise, and decreased ability to think, concentrate, and to make decisions. So, you know, you're working with these patients and something just might not seem right. So these are some things to kind of keep in the back of our head. Bipolar disorder um, with mania, you may see optimism, excitability, hyperactivity, talkativeness. Um, and this is not just the normal chatty Kathy. This is they're talking and you are unable to get a word in edgewise. It's almost like there are no periods in any of their sentences and they will just go, you know, as long as you will let them go. There will be a decreased need for sleep. There may be heightened sexual interest or risk-taking behavior, as well as irritability. In terms of schizophrenia, uh, the signs and symptoms will really be based on the phase, whether that's the prodromal active or residual phase. Um, you may see affective flattening, uh, elogia, which is speechlessness, evolution, which is unwillingness to respond or act, an inability to experience pleasure, delusions, hallucinations, social withdrawal, uh, catatonia, Etc. So there, there are a lot of things um, that you may see with this patient, depending on where they are in those phases. Other things to think about um, is lithium toxicity, which may be utilized. So uh, you may see ataxia, confusion, all the way to delirium. You may see hypertonia, um, and in high overdoses, or just you know, maybe the patient isn't processing you know the lithium renally as well as they could be. Uh, you may see seizures, and even coma. So what are we going to do for these patients? Uh, we're going to get a really great sample history. Uh, we're going to do a really great suicidal and homicidal ideation assessment. Um, you really want to ensure that you are safe and that you are able to keep this patient safe. So it's an assessment you should be doing with these patients and really all of your patients, you know, there is a certain level of anxiety as involved when someone has to go to the hospital because they're not feeling well, or if they have to call EMS, they're scared because something is off, something is not right. So, you know, things to kind of keep in the back of your head, there's always an element of psych in any patient that you may come upon. And again, just being situationally aware. Let's talk about neurological insults section for this. 
These are some signs and symptoms of increased intracranial pressure. You may see a headache, you may see nausea, vomiting, amnesia, behavioral changes, restlessness, drowsiness, hypo or hyperarousability. I had a patient once who was having some signs and symptoms, and he was actually crawling all, all around his bed. I could not keep him in the bed itself. Um, he was wild man Sam. So kind of things to think about. Um, it may not just be a depressed mental status. It, it may, he may be hyper, hyper arousable. Uh, we want to identify these signs and symptoms as soon as possible because we don't want to get to the late signs and symptoms. We were seeing asymmetric pupil reactivity, uh, unilateral or bilateral pupillary dilation. So this is due to uh, a lesion impinging on cranial nerve 3. We talk about uncle herniation. Basically what the lesion will do is it will press up against cranial nerve 3. That will knock out the parasympathetic response. So that's why you have the, the big old wide pupils on that one side. Uh, because it's the sympathetic response that is left. And sympathetic response, I, I like to think about it as you're in a room with a lion and there is no glass between you. It's a sympathetic response. Eyes get really big. You may see abnormal posturing, uh, decorticate posturing. So they, uh, I think, decorticate towards the core. So everything is kind of folding in towards the core. Uh, decerebrate, which is worse off, is away. So uh, decerebrate is, is the opposite of decorticate. And you can also see uh, Cushing's triad here. Uh, so you're going to see a widening pulse pressure, which is the difference between the systolic and the diastolic is getting really, really big. You'll see bradycardia. And you'll see a decreased respiratory effort, such as Shane Stokes respirations or Biot's respirations. So Shane Stokes respirations uh, are progressively deeper and sometimes faster breathing, followed by a gradual decrease, resulting in apnea. This is a pattern, and this pattern repeats with each cycle usually taking about 30 seconds to 2 minutes to occur. Biot's respirations, on the other hand, are groups of quick, shallow inspirations, followed by regular or irregular periods of apnea. So what are we going to do for a basic neurologic assessment here? We're going to assess level of consciousness. Are they alert? Do they respond to verbal stimuli, painful stimuli, or are they unresponsive? Are they oriented? Now this isn't, do you know your name? That's a yes or a no question. Because the way I'm going to answer that question if I am confused is yes. Yes, I know my name. Of course I know my name. How dare you ask me if I know my name? Keep your questions open-ended. It will be much more telling about where your patient kind of is in the grand scheme of life. What is your name? Where are we right now? What month and year is it? Why are you here? What's going on? And in terms of, of dates, I like month and year best because I'm alert and oriented and I have no idea what day it is on any given day. So um, month and year, they should be able to get that right. Um, if they're having trouble with that, you can give them time of the year. So are we in the springtime, summertime, fall, winter, etc.? And then who's the president? Of course, you can kind of always keep stepping back. You can also give people options um, if they're acutely confused or having a hard time. You give a question like, what month it is right now? Uh, is it January, February, June, or May? Well, it's May right now. If you do give people options, such as that, uh, rotate where the correct answer is. Otherwise, they'll just keep picking the third answer, and they'll know that they'll probably be right or close to right. Speech. Talk about naming objects. Um, so we're assessing for aphasia. Um, I'm assessing to see if it's clear or if it's slurred. Um, are they able to name objects? When they name objects, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick something that they have seen before in their lives, something normal, part of everyday life. I'm not going to pick my stethoscope or my blood pressure cuff, anything like that. I'm going to pick something like a key or my glasses or a pen. Keep these things kind of normal. Um, I also uh, assess color. Um, are they able to come up with colors? Again, don't do something weird like fuchsia. Uh, try to stick to things that are a normal color, you know, your basic rainbow. And also kind of be mindful that people may be colorblind. So that's something you should know about your patient. Or if you're wearing like a really dark colored shirt, someone may say, oh, it's black. 
if you're wearing a navy shirt or they may say it's blue. Um, both of those answers are appropriate. Navy's, again, not truly that, that rainbow color that I told you guys to kind of stick with. So just kind of be mindful. If it's close to another color, give them a little bit of leeway. And then I'll also have them read basic letters, basic numbers here. Pearl, I'm looking to see if their pupils are equal, round, reactive to light, and accommodative. All right, so I'm taking my pen light and I'm holding their chin and I'm having them keep their eyes open to the best of their ability and I'm coming in from the side. All right, and I will do that to both pupils and I'm ensuring that the pupils react appropriately to the light. When assessing visual field cuts, I suggest holding the patient's chin and then informing them that they need to look straight at you as you go into uh, the ends of their visual fields and put up a couple fingers each. So how many fingers am I holding into each of their four visual fields there looking for visual field cuts? Um, a lot of people will turn their eyes or will turn their head if you're not holding their chin. So again, just ensuring that you're uh, instructing them for that. When looking for nystagmus, um, I'm taking my pen and I'm making a H, letter H, um, through their visual field. Again, holding their chin makes it so that when they're following your pen light or your pen or your finger, whatever you happen to be using, uh, through the, uh, the motions of their visual field, that they don't start turning their head to follow the H, but their eyes actually do it. And you're looking for this shaking almost. I'll then have them smile, and what I'm looking for here is droop. Um, so I'm looking to ensure that their smile is symmetric on both sides. Um, sometimes people say, well, I don't like my smile. <laughs> and uh, you just kind of have to assure them what you're looking for, and some reassurance goes a long way. Tongue deviation. Again, these are all cranial nerves that I'm, I'm looking at here. Um, I'll have them stick their tongue out. And then by having them smile, having them stick their tongue out at me, I'm also assessing for their ability to follow commands. Drift. I'm going to have them hold both their arms out, close their eyes. Um, I, I tell them to make like you're holding a pizza box. So their palms are going to be up towards the sky as they hold their arms out. And I'm going to close, have them close their eyes and hold it for 10 seconds. And what I'm looking is for an inward rotation and a dropping of one of their arms. When looking for strengths in extremities, I'm going to have them grab two fingers on each of my hands. If you have them grab more than that, you, you may find that they squeeze your hands very, very hard, which hurts. Um, so I'm going to have them grab two fingers in each of my hands. I'm going to have them squeeze to assess their grip strength and to ensure that it's the same on both sides. Then I'm going to have them push me away and pull me back. When assessing for strengths, um, I'm looking for a couple different things here. Scored on a 0 out of 5 scale. 5 being full strength, 0 being flaccid, 3 being the ability to pick their extremity up against gravity. And then you have the kind of in-betweens, right? So a, a score of a 4 would be not quite full strength. So they're able to give me some resistance when they're pushing me back, but it, it's not as strong as it should be. Now keep in mind when you're scoring these strengths that the bodybuilder is going to have a very different looking five than the little old lady. So kind of keep that in the back of your head. Something that you may score a four for that bodybuilder may be a full strength for that little old lady. When you are looking at a one, you're just kind of looking at muscle activation of the arm or whatever you're assessing here. And then a two would be they're able to start to lift the extremity against gravity, but are unable to kind of get it all the way up against gravity. In terms of uh, inattention and sensation, in terms of inattention, I may rotate which side of the bed I'm working on to see if that they will follow me all the way through. And you're looking at that um, when you're looking at uh, visual field cuts as well, um, when you're assessing for nystagmus, if they're able to kind of follow you off to both um, visual fields here. Um, and you're look, also looking at sensation. So I'll actually touch uh, three different places on the face, both sides of the arms, and both sides of the legs. And what I'll ask them is, which side am I touching? So it may be one side or the other, or it may be both, See to ensure that they can feel it. I'll do both sides to ensure that they can feel both sides, because sometimes you may touch their left side 
and they'll say, oh, you're touching my left. They'll have them close their eyes while they're doing this as well so that they can't cheat. Oh, you're touching my left. And you'll touch them on the right side. And they're like, oh, yeah, you're touching my left. Those are all things that are reportable that you're looking for. In terms of traumatic, traumatic injury here, um, there are quite a few. Concussions are more and more common as contact sports going on, though they are doing their best to create better helmets. Um, so you may see concussion resulting from a misuse of equipment. The equipment is actually too big. See concussions from that as well. So just be mindful that the grades of concussions are based on the GCS, which is something I would also recommend doing with all of your patients here. And they may worsen a little bit over time. So a mild concussion may move to a moderate concussion, and moderate concussion may move to a severe concussion. And these are all based on GCS and whether there are any findings with scans. In terms of head bleeds, um, I've put a few of them here. Uh, epidural, which is above the dura. So if you think your brain is kind of like an onion, it has layers. You have the dura matter, the arachnoid matter, and the pia matter is the closest one to the brain itself. Epidural bleed is above the dura. This is due to a laceration of the middle meningeal artery. Um, arteries bleed fast. This is a neurosurgical emergency. So these people need to get to a neurosurgeon like yesterday. What you'll see with these patients is that there's a transient loss of consciousness followed by a period of lucidity, and then there's a rapid deterioration. So this is due to an increase in ICP as that artery leads into the uh, cranial vault. And if you think about the brain and how it's housed. Um, it is housed in a fixed vault and due to the Monroe Kelly Doctrine, the only way to change ICP is to add or subtract stuff inside this fixed vault. So adding blood, uh, you're going to increase ICP. Uh, subdural bleeds are due to a tearing of bridging veins. So this is below the dura. Uh, people who are most at risk for this are the elderly, people on anticoagulants and your chronic alcohol users. So just kind of keep that in the back of your head. Uh, if you are an EMS or an emergency department nurse or what have you, and you are working with a patient who you see not infrequently, their altered mental status may not be due to alcohol intoxication, but may be because they have a bleed. There are uh, three different flavors here, acute, chronic, and acute on chronic. Acute subdurals, you may not see signs and symptoms for up to 72 hours after injury. Where chronic, it may take up to two weeks to see these signs and symptoms. So it becomes very, very difficult. You know, how far back am I asking about history when you're trying to assess for these kinds of bleeds? Acute on chronic would be uh, someone who has a kind of this chronic bleed at baseline, and then they go ahead and maybe they hit their head on something, such as a doorway or what have you, and now they have an acute bleed as well. I did put uh, subarachnoid bleeds there because they're typically not traumatic, um, but they certainly can be. This is bleeding below the arachnoid matter, and this is often due to an aneurysm rupture. What you'll see here is people will present with a headache. Now, this isn't your normal run-of-the-mill everyday kind of headache. This is what we call a thunderclap headache. This isn't something that just kind of generally builds throughout the day. This is an acute, abrupt onset of, quote, the worst headache of my life. So this is a rapid onset. Like I said, this will buy people up to two weeks in the hospital, and that's because we have a concern for vasospasm, which commonly occurs four to seven days after, after a rupture. Vasospasm uh, is what it sounds like. The, the vein spasms, which restricts blood flow, which could lead to ischemia um, and a secondary injury. We have a few other neurologic disorders here. <laughs> Uh, seizures in postictal states, uh, patients will certainly be altered. Um, they may or may not be able to respond to you, depending on where they kind of are, if they're uh, currently seizing, what kind of seizure it is, or if they're in a postictal state, they may not be responsive. Um, strokes or TIAs um, are a common cause for altered mental status. People may start speaking funny. Uh, they may not be responding appropriately. Uh, they may not be able to speak at all. Um, or TIAs, you know, this these periods that last for a short period of time here. However, TIAs, you need to keep in the back of your head that um, if a TIA occurs, the patient has a significantly higher chance of having a stroke within the next three months. 
uh, meningitis uh, can certainly cause or alter mental status as well, all the way to death. Meningitis can be can be very deadly. Rabies, people who are confused, agitated, you know, maybe they, they took in a new pet. Uh, maybe they decided to have a, an atypical pet, such as a raccoon, uh, start living with them. Maybe they've traveled to another country and they've interacted with the wildlife. So all things you kind of have to keep in the back of your head. Uh, maybe they've been exposed to a bat in the house, which is something that we see very commonly down here. Um, all of these things can lead to acute altered mental status. Uh, dementia patients, unfortunately, uh, these patients may be confused at baseline. You may see some sound downing where they get acutely altered at night, kind of things to keep in the back of your head looking at the patient's history. And then a neoplasm uh, can also cause depressed mental status as well, again, due to an increased ICP. So what are we going to do for these patients? Um, you're going to do a really fabulous stroke exam whatever your hospital or EMS protocol, your county's protocol, what have you, uh, recommends, uh, such as the Cincinnati, etc. You're going to do a great stroke exam, assess for your signs of increased ICP, look at your vital signs. Your vital signs are great. They are points on a map for you. They allow you, as you trend them, to determine the trajectory of the patient and kind of where they're going. Are they improving? Are they worsening? Are they staying the same? This kind of allows you to to make a plan for the patient as you can start to trend those things. I would also do a really good full assessment on these patients looking for other reasons why they are altered. So let's go back to our case. How are we going to approach this patient? Well, we don't really know what's wrong with them yet. So we're going to do a good sample history. We're going to ask our bystanders, ask our family members, you know, what's going on, ask, ask our friends, you know, his friends, what's going on here, try to gather what's going on, what his past medical history is, if he's on any medications at all. We'll do a full assessment. Uh, we'll start with our neuro exam uh, and we'll work our way down, but we really want to hit a full assessment because there could be a myriad of other things that are causing this gentleman to be altered. We're going to get sets of vital signs. We're going to trend his vital signs to ensure that he is improving, not deteriorating. Uh, we will very quickly get a finger stick blood sugar. In fact, that may be one of the first things that we do, uh, so long as it is safe to do so and it is within your protocol to do so. That's an easy way to rule in and rule out metabolic disarray from hypo or hyperglycemia. We'll also consider oxygen, because uh, he may be hypoxic, which may be why he's agitated. We'll do a 12-lead ECG. So we're looking at our possible differential diagnoses. All of these things are still on the list. If you look to the left, lists are illicit drug use. He smells of alcohol. Um, so it's pretty high on our differential here. Respiratory disorders, he's agitated. He could be hypoxic. Uh, metabolic disarray, though he's acting altered, he may be hypoglycemic. Um, psychiatric disorders, um, again, he's in the right age group for some of these things to begin to occur if he doesn't already have a history of it. A traumatic injury, though he doesn't have any signs of overt trauma, doesn't mean he wasn't involved in something and the signs haven't kind of shown up yet, or some other neurologic disorder. So what was wrong with this patient? The friend arrives and tells you that the patient was struck in the head several times while in a fight. Uh, he receives a CT scan. He's diagnosed with a subarachnoid hemorrhage and was sent to the neuro ICU. So though he was very intoxicated, we can't just say, okay, he's just intoxicated. We'll allow him to sleep it off or whatever, because that would have ended very, very badly. Talking about subarachnoid hemorrhages, that will buy you up to two weeks in the hospital. So again, always keep your, uh, your mindset open. Have a wide differential such that uh, we don't miss anything, because there are multiple causes for altered mental status, and that history is important. Thank you for spending your time with me today. I hope to see you back soon.